Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming to Flower of Capitalism's uh, Cultural Logic of South Korean Advertising. My name is Luce Lanzar. I'm the program officer for Korean Studies here. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Olga Fedorenko. She is the assistant professor and faculty fellow at the Department of East Asian Studies at New York University. She received her PhD from the East Asian Studies Department of the University of Toronto in November 2012, and her articles appear in the Korean Popular Cultural Reader and in the Feminist Media Studies. She is currently working on a book manuscript entitled Flower of Capitalism, South Korean Advertising at a Crossroads. Her research interests cover anthropology of media, including advertising and digital media, consumer movements and consumer citizenship, contemporary capitalism, and local neoliberalisms. She also holds an MBA from Yonsei University in Seoul, South Korea, and a bachelor's in Korean studies from Moscow State University in Russia. Please welcome Dr. Fedorenko. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. So my presentation is based on the book I'm working on. And the book itself is about contests around advertising in South Korea in the first decade of the 21st century. But looking at Luz's abstract for my talk, which I kind of revised, I thought that I probably should leave the contests aside for the moment and focus on what is special about South Korean advertising. And that's kind of the focus of my talk today. And if you're interested in contests, I'd be happy to bring them up for Q&A. OK, so I will begin by explaining what I mean by cultural logic of advertising and what I see as the cultural logic of South Korean ad advertising. And then I will give you three extended examples of how this cultural logic manifests in contemporary Korea. And those three examples will be the main part of the talk. OK. so. Flower of Capitalism, or Chabunjuekot, for those of you who speak Korean, is a cliche metaphor for advertising in South Korea. And this metaphor sneaks into articles about advertising, both appreciative and critical. Also, floral patterns are surprisingly common on conference brochures, on advertising-related conferences, and other publications. First, I registered this Flower of Capitalism metaphor when puzzling over the cover of this book. And I hope you could see it from there. It's decorated by little flowers, Mugunhua, Korean national flower. And the book was presented to me by one of the authors, Professor Shin and Sop. And I was a little bit surprised because otherwise it's actually a pretty serious book on Korean advertising. So I asked why those flowers on the cover. And he's, I asked, like, is it to symbol, like, as a symbol of Koreanness, Mugunghwa, Korean national flower? And he said, yes, but also because advertising is a flower of capitalism. And I told him I never heard of that. And at that point, he was surprised because he assumed it's an international metaphor for advertising. And he actually believed that it was coined by some North American scholar. So for English speakers, flower of capitalism is likely to evoke negative connotations. In English, flower of capitalism is usually reserved for war, economic crisis, financial speculations, and other highly problematic effects of capitalism. In Korea, to call something flower off is basically to point how it is a crucial part of a particular phenomenon, and generally to express appreciation for both that part and the phenomenon itself. So it's kind of like a flower is a culmination in the life of a plant. So when I was uh, researching this expression, an example I came up, came up was election, elections are the flower of democracy. So advertising the flower of capitalism. I will specify the connotations of this metaphor, flower of capitalism, through a short article which was written by Professor Park Hyo-shin of prestigious Yonsei University. And this article came out in a children's edition of a national daily, Tong Albo. So the article goes, advertising is called the flower of capitalism. Advertising is as common in our surroundings as air or water. After the Industrial Revolution in the United States, automobiles became mass produced, and the advertising industry developed greatly. The financial support that private newspapers and private broadcasters receive is also precisely from advertising. 
The article proceeds to give an example of advertising, to which I will get in a second. For now, I'd like you to notice how in this article, advertising's commercial functions are completely ignored. Even though the writer mentions the industrial revolution and transition to mass production, nothing is said about how advertising is created and circulated to sell commodities. Media dependence on advertising is presented as a public service that advertising performs, not as a for-profit use of media. Typical of many other South Korean popular cultural texts about advertising, the article contains not a single trace of caution against advertising, just eager appreciation. And remember that this article is written for children. Early in my research, I was quite incredulous about such unreserved praises for advertising. And they are also to be found in advertising museum and popular books about advertising, definitely in blogosphere. After all, the mainstream of South Korean advertising, that's a snapshot of it, is not that different from advertising everywhere. South Korean advertising attempts to manipulate desires. It heavily relies on sex appeal. It plays on insecurities and anxieties. So it's the usual advertising that you know from your own everyday experience. So my first impulse was to dismiss those flowery praises for advertising as unsettled propaganda by the advertising industry, particularly ominous when directed towards children, as in Park's piece. However, eventually I came to a different conclusion. I realized that such flowery depictions were not meant as a description of advertising as it is, but rather a prescription of what advertising should be. So the flower of capitalism, with all the positive connotations explained in Park's article, is an ideal held up for South Korean advertising. And this ideal inspired expectations and demands, which would be unthinkable in many other places, as my later examples will, will illustrate. So Pat's example of representative South Korean advertising further clarifies this pro-public ideal of advertising. The article continues with an example of an ad which Park presents as representative of all South Korean advertising. It is a 1984 corporate ad for Sanyong Group. It's um, very simple in its execution. It shows two lunch boxes, and the story there is kind of told as a first-person story of someone who recalls a teacher who in difficult times always brought two lunch boxes to school to give one box to hungry students. And one day, teacher gave up both boxes to students, saying that he's feeling unwell. And the question on top of that, that he must, he must be feeling unwell, but basically teacher is pretending to give his food to students. So the article con continues to praise that, and it presents it as an advertising in which the 100-year history of Korean advertising culminated. And he also mentioned that this is commercial, um, sorry, I uh, just wanted to say that Park's appreciation for this advertising is not unique. And in fact, when this ad appeared, it was covered in the newspapers. Right now, you would find it in most advertising history textbooks. So it is considered very iconic advertising in Korea, and it would be familiar to many advertising observers. So Park is not at all original to pick it as representative of South Korean advertising. And the way he praises it, he points out that it ha it has not a single line which says it promotes the company or its products. So basically, for all, for most practical purposes, this commercial advertising blends with public service announcements, and this is what Park sees as the special, the praiseworthy part of this advertising. So it's not an ad that brought the highest revenues for the advertiser, and it's not an ad that won international prizes. It's an ad that blends with public service messages. So this is what I mean by cultural logic of South Korean advertising. It is the common sense ideas of what advertising is, what it should be, what could be expected of it. 
We call it a cultural logic is to distinguish it from advertising's instrumental logic. And by instrumental logic, I mean very basic things that advertising is made to sell commodities to advance interests of advertisers. This instrumental logic of advertising is what critics of advertising usually target when they condemn advertising for manipulating consumers, silencing critical media, and so on. Cultural logic does not necessarily erase the commercial purposes of advertising, but it creates additional expectations which might coincide or run counter to this instrumental logic. So what I discovered when researching South Korean advertising is that there are certain expectations that downplay the marketing purposes of advertising and privilege advertising's potential for public service, both with advertising messages and with advertising revenues. Park's article is quite representative in that regard. In popular imaginaries, commercial functions of advertising are often subordinated to public interest, which is generally understood as interest of a middle class consumer and at times is contrasted to the interests of advertisers, big companies, and those tensions animate contests around advertising in Korea. To avoid possible misunderstanding, the origins of this cultural logic are not in some innate cultural traits, but in concrete historical events whose outcomes resulted in the current situation. So I emphasize I'm not making like Confucianism or that kind of argument. Rather, I want to say that there were specific developments with Korean advertising that resulted in these ideas that subordinate commercial advertising to ideas of public good. And I have a list of those factors. I will not go into them in detail. If you like, I could talk about it later, but just to briefly go through them. First of all, the history of capitalism in Korea, the way it appeared before colonial period when there were threats to Korea's independence. So uh, capitalism was embraced as a nationalist project to defend Korea's independence. That one big thing. Um, another thing that the way advertising was regulated, many lasting institutions of advertising were set up during Chon Du Hwan, who set it up to control media. However, the justification for those reforms were in terms of public interest, and those discourses kind of stuck, and those institutions continued till about 2008. Um, okay, so I'll just leave it at that, and if you want to talk about it later, I'll be happy to bring it up during Q&A. So for the rest of the talk, I'd like to talk about how this cultural logic manifests in reality and like how can we see it in present day Korean advertising. So my first example is about advertising content. It is so-called humanist advertising. I already mentioned that the mainstream of South Korean advertising is no more publicly minded than advertising everywhere else. However, it is campaigns like this 1984 lunchbox that are considered most representative of South Korean advertising. Like, as I said, lunchbox is, when it came out, it was celebrated in many newspapers, and in a way, it kind of inaugurated a whole subgenre of advertising in Korea. Commercial advertising, which abandons a commercial message, which does not talk about the advertiser, but instead circulates feel-good sentimental messages in the name of public interest. This subgenre of advertising is known by different names. Corporate public service advertising, sentimental advertising, emotional advertising, Korean style advertising, humanist advertising, and simply kind advertising. I generally use humanist advertising because that's how it came to my attention first. But like there is no single term, and generally they used the uh, mixed when such advertising is discussed in the media. In the first decade of the 21st century, such humanist ads were epitomized by toward people campaign by SK Telecom, and I'd like to show you this award-winning hero edition. So the last scene was a reference to an actual incident when someone fell on, fell on tracks on Seoul subway and people pushed the train to save the person. And the message is we, each of us is a hero for someone.
So this commercial exemplifies the rules of this subgenre. It's exceptionally rather sentimental story. It's audiovisual execution is pretty sentimental, like let it be sung by children, doesn't get any more melodramatic. The message itself is very soft, very humanistic. You're encouraged to identify it, to feel this warmth in your heart. And indeed, that's kind of a reaction that this advertising gets in Korea. So this is one of the examples of reactions to this ad in the internet, and I'll read it. When I saw this ad, I choked with emotions. We all are a hero for someone. This copy tremendously touched my heart. It is just images of what everyone likely had experienced in every day, accompanied by one word labels, but it became an ad with which we all could identify, which we all could feel deeply in our hearts. I remember how I would come up to TV because I heard the background music of this commercial when doing other things. So this kind of reaction, it's from a blog and it's quite representative of the way people talk about this advertising. And when I saw it first, I was again, quite in disbelief because to me, perhaps I'm cynical that way, it seemed a little bit over the top, over syrupy, kind of a bit too sentimental. Also the fact that it is advertising, it tries to play on emotions to sell commodities kind of interfered with me being moved to this advertising, like to the point of being teary. Yet I was unable to find any critical reactions to this and similar ads on the internet. Moreover, I would bring them up with my Korean acquaintances and kind of try to question if any of them were kind of skeptical that it is an advertiser trying to exploit the emotions basically to make a profit, to make a sale, and I was accused of being a jaded cynic. So that's kind of not appropriate reaction for this ad. You're supposed to be moved, and it's okay to be moved by advertising because that's kind of the genre, how it's produced, and that's how you consume it. So the point I'm making with humanist advertising for this talk is that humanist ads, the ideal of commercial advertising in Korea, destabilize what commercial advertising is. They remain advertising only in their form, but lose content that could count as advertising for most practical purposes. They forget advertiser and consumption and instead talk about values, humanism, and everyday life. In that sense, such advertising becomes another popular cultural product, such as soap operas. And incidentally, that's how it is consumed for emotional pleasures. Indeed, one of the common praises for humanist advertising is that it is advertising that is not advertising like in Korean, Kwango Serupchian and Kwango. And many would propose it as ideal for advertising, so you kind of get the paradox that the most ideal advertising is advertising that it's not doing what advertising is supposed to do. So what are effects of all this? It's hard to say something definitive about the commercial effects of such ads. They are very popular with consumers and when people, like when different research companies do surveys, this such ads would score very high in consumer recall and consumer appreciation. Do they sell? No one really knows, like it's like similar to the rest of advertising. It's really hard to identify cause and effect and pin sale effects to particular advertising campaigns. Uh, for my arguments, I would like to say that what this ads definitely do, they create a particular image for advertising, which is quite influential. It creates particular expectations for advertising. It holds up a pretty high ideal against the rest of Korean advertising as compared. Okay, so now I'm moving on to what this flower of capitalism ideal means for advertising practitioners, advertising makers, the other ones who are making advertising after all. Um, okay. And during my field work, I was actually quite surprised to realize that advertising producers were most taken in by this vision of advertising as committed to serving public, serving the public. Many of them, particularly those of the younger generation, got into advertising precisely because they saw it as this medium for public good. And the slide I have, it's of. Um, celebrity creative director Park Geun-hyun, and he's the guy who made that hero advertising which I just showed you. And he's quite known in Korea, he's often in the media, he published 
think at least two books by now, and I have him on the cover of his first book called Advertising <coughs> Through the Humanities. And there he talks about how the quote here, my interest is always not in the advertising, in winning the advertising festival prizes, but in communication with the masses, with screen masses. And note that both incentives for making advertising, which he considers, have nothing to do with selling commodities. It's either kind of artistic inspiration to win prizes or talking to Korean masses. And in his book, Park talks a lot how it is a commonsensical thing that his ads strive towards public service messages. And most Koreans would know his tremendously popular campaigns that traced awareness of issues pertinent to Korean society. Uh, Park's campaign, for example, taught that age is just a number. Jeans and neckties are equal. Then he had a campaign about first woman admitted to South Korean army, and the slogan of that was, I acknowledge the difference, but I challenge discrimination. So this kind of socially engaged advertising is his signature, and his campaigns are well known and well appreciated for this social consciousness. So for him, advertising is effectively a socially engaged art. Well, and Park, he earned celebrity status in Korea, and in that sense is admittedly somewhat extreme. But such sentiments are common among regular advertising makers, as I observed during my internship at an advertising agency in Korea in 2010. The campaigns that regular advertising makers found most meaningful would be the ones engaged with social issues or were seen as helping the underdog. Um, Central character in one of my chapters about advertising work, I call him Kim Pujang or Director Kim. He talked about how he poured his heart into a campaign for rice snacks for one of Korea's conglomerates. He was not particularly concerned about the conglomerate's profits, but he saw it as his way to help Korean rice farmers whose economic struggles are notorious in Korea. So he wanted to make a campaign well, so lots of those rice snacks are sold, so that a lot of rice is bought from Korean farmers and they live a little bit better. So he saw advertising as a way to solve social problems in Korea, not just to sell commodities. And predictably, advertisers, advertising, advertiser companies are not always sympathetic with such flagrant neglect for the commodity. Characteristically, the campaign that Ha Hyun, this guy, was proud most, failed to sell. Okay, and I'd like to play it for you. So the end of the narration, that year one candle lightened up the world brightly, all thought it was impossible, impossible is nothing. So this was an ad meant for Adidas, but Adidas refused to buy it. And it did not stop Park from sharing this commercial online and mentioning in his book. And when I was doing my research in 2010, it's probably one of the easiest ads to find in Korea. And in fact, Korean netizens critiqued Adidas for being so narrow-minded and not buying this advertising. So this is an example of how Park's romantic vision of advertising as a means of communication with the masses clashed with advertising functions as a sales tool. As I mentioned, Park has earned his celebrity status in Korea, and generally he's able to produce and sell advertising, which is somewhat controversial. For regular advertising makers, it's always a struggle. They often complain about how they would very much like to make socially engaged creative advertising, but Korean advertisers are so, so narrow-minded, it's impossible. Um, they do find like little openings when they could incorporate messages they think are important for Korean public to hear. And I don't know if you noticed, um, poster for this talk, it had this commercial for Soju ad, and that ad is actually made by female creatives who saw themselves as fighting Korean patriarchy by portraying active female sexuality. And like when I saw it first, I was like, thought that it's a regular kind of sexist advertising that objectifies women, but I ended up meeting some of them and they talked about how, well, you know, it's advertising, but there are opportunities and we are trying to challenge this norm. So I don't know if I'm necessarily buying the story, but the consciousness that advertising is this 
public medium to talk to Korean public about issues and opportunity to make a social change is very much present in advertising agencies and demand advertising makers. Um, not all advertising practitioners, however, are willing to compromise and the most extreme example of this dedication to advertising as a public service medium comes from creative director Iji Sok, whose story I'd like to tell you too. So from his early youth, he was enchanted with advertising and dreamed of becoming an ad man. But Korean agencies looked down on his art diploma from a provincial college. So unable to get an advertising job in Korea, he eventually entered the School of Visual Arts in New York. He showed up in New York with $50 in his pocket, and we're talking like around 2004. So $50 in his po pocket, and he was incredibly poor when he started his studying, but that situation changed very quickly because he started winning all these student advertisers, advertising prizes one after another, after another, after another. And within two years, not only he landed a job with a reputable international advertising agency in New York, he also won more international advertising awards than any other Korean advertising practitioner at that at the age of 28. So his success won him attention from the Korean media and Korean advertising, Korean advertising agencies now showered him with generous employment offers, which he enjoyed rejecting. In the end, he returned to Korea in 2009 and set up his own company, Ijeos Oaks Advertising Lab. Around the time, he also published the book, very humbly entitled Advertising Genius, Ijeos Oak. And uh, there he explains his radical position on committing advertising to public interest. And I'll give you a quote from a book which is not here. So he writes, in reality, buying Nike shoes and making advertising is to have everyone live well. If so, what kind of advertising would make everyone live happily? Of course, an advertising that makes people buy beautiful shoes, slightly wider apartments, or new dresses would be a happy advertisement. Is it not a much happy advertisement, though, that could give homes to homeless people, give clothes to people who are freezing to death? Is not advertising more meaningful when rather than making successful people more successful, it saves dying people, it revives people who are struggling? His earnest wrestling with such questions led to a break with commercial advertising. His own agency specializes in public service advertisements. As he explained in a media interview, and this is a quote I have there, advertising that encourages consumption gives poor people the feeling of relative poverty and inferiority. I don't want to make advertising for the minority, but public service, public interest advertising for the majority. He did take commercial accounts, but only on the condition that advertisers would respect his vision of advertising. And that resulted in some curious campaigns. I'd like to show you his ad for fair trade chocolate. Okay, so I'm moving to my third and final example. And this is about how pro-public cultural logic of advertising manifested on the ground as a consumer movement, which attempted to make advertising serve public interest by democratizing advertising money. So the name of the organi organization is the Media Consumer Sovereignty Campaign, Alonso Bija Tukon Campaign in Korean, and commonly it's abbreviated as Onsoju. That's how we'll call them. So Onsoju emerged from the chaos of summer 2008. Back then, downtown Seoul was engulfed with anti-US beef protests, and they started as protests against allowing imports of allegedly contaminated US beef, but developed into mass movement against current Iman Bak's government. At the time, the three main conservative dailies, Choson Albo, Dong Albo, and Chungang Albo, collectively known as the Chojondon, covered the protests extremely, extremely negatively. On the other hand, the oppositional progressive dailies, the Han Kyore and Kyunghyun Shinmun, sided with the protesters. And just to give you some background, many in Korea consider the Chojundon, the three conservative newspapers, a political force in its own right. 
the church and Don are critiqued for colluding with big business, for harassing non-conservatives. Some went as far as accusing them of driving progressive president Noh Hyun to suicide. So Aung San Suu the consumer organization I'm interested in, were in that camp that saw Cho Jun Don as extremely problematic. So Aung San Suu emerged as an internet forum which condemned what they called the distorted coverage of the anti-US beef protests by the conservative Cho Jun Don. The forum popularity grew exponentially with 40,000 people joining within days of its founding. The website made public lists of advertisers who published, uh, who placed their ads only in the conservative media and not in the progressive media. And the organization, Onso Jude, demanded that advertisers distribute their advertising equally to ensure democracy in Korea. The public was encouraged to call the advertisers to tell them to stop advertising in the conservative press because of their distorted coverage under threat of consumer boycott. In their public manifestos and press conferences, the protesters presented their campaign as consumer activism. They argued that the three conservative newspapers were violating their rights as media consumers to have access to unbiased information, but also as consumers of advertisers' commodities, and as such, they were entitled to have a say how advertising budgets are spent. In the short term, the Onsuju okay, actually have a the depiction of the situation by uh, a conservative organization, so it's not sympathetic to Onsuju, but I'll explain it in a second. So in short term, the Onsuju campaign turned out quite effective. According to Onsoju itself, on a given day, tens of thousands of calls were made, and the offices of the Chojundun advertisers were paralyzed with an avalanche of calls. Some of those calls, according to late investigation, got out of hand and included not only foul language, but even death threats to advertising managers and their families. In about three weeks after the beginning of the campaign, many advertisers indeed pulled their ads from the Chojundun, and the three newspapers had to reduce their number of pages. In the meantime, Seoul police began an investigation into Onsoju activities. Eventually, 24 people were found guilty of the obstruction of business, and two main organizers received 10 and six months in jail, suspended for two years, and the rest of participants were fined. So that was happening in 2008. And uh, Seoul District Court ruled that consumers were lawfully entitled to boycott newspapers' advertisers to sway editorial policies, and it was just the angry calls which obstructed business and constituted a criminal offense. And this court ruling was taken seriously by new on Soju leader, Kim Son gyun and here he is with a poster there. And he was organizing a new campaign to boycott advertisers of conservative newspapers in the summer 2009. To avoid legal problems, Kim's strategy was to abstain from calling the advertisers and to post online updates about not buying the boycotted brands. And Samsung was one of the boycott targets, and here is Kim with a poster that says that he boycotts Samsung that advertises in the conservative daily Chosun Elbo. When I met On Soju leader Kim Song Gyun, this guy, he explained how An Soju goal was to achieve a democratic public sphere whose absence On Soju members saw as a major obstacle towards achieving social and economic justice in Korea. And interestingly enough, advertising was a weapon of choice to change things for the better. They quote Kim. If advertising no longer goes to those guys, the Chojun Don newspapers, a huge change will arise. Because those guys in the Chojun Don publish distorted reports and lie, people cannot know the precise facts. At the Chojun Don, with their way, as the power of those guys decides, those guys declines, everything can be achieved normally. This is not simply a problem of newspaper companies. Our country's democracy, our country's history, our country's development, everything culminates here. So, the struggle over Korean democracy, history, development, and everything warranted a suspension of advertising's commercial functions and of advertisers' discretion over allocation of their advertising money. And if advertisers, sorry. So 
what I want to emphasize is that somehow advertising was a central weapon in the struggle for Korean history, democracy, and it's particular ideas about advertising that put it in the center of this controversy. I have another quote from Kim. Advertising in the Chojundon and the distorted newspapers is the same as distorting and committing wrongdoings. Advertising can simply be defined as capitalism, but the notion of advertising in our country is that giving money to those companies is cooperating with their deeds and committing a crime. So according to Kim, it was a crime to fail to prioritize advertising's obligations to the public. The law that is transgressed here is obviously not any official law, but rather the cultural logic of Korean advertising. So Onso Ju was disciplining advertisers to live up to the ideal of advertising as a medium that serves public interest. So just as a year before that, the police started an investigation and Onso Ju leader and key moderators were uh, prosecuted for obstruction of business and the leader actually for also intimidation and extortion. Eventually, Kim was found guilty and sentenced to 10 months jail term, suspended for two years. He appealed the decision through all the levels of Korean judiciary and was found guilty again and again and again. So there are many fascinating aspects to this story. For the purposes of this talk, I would like to put the politics of it aside and emphasize that the kind of activism On Soju was doing was thinkable because of the ideas about advertising as a medium with public obligations, not simply as a tool of advertisers to be used how advertising please. Okay, so this leads me to a conclusion of my talk and I hope I convinced you by now that in South Korea there has been a particular cultural logic of advertising in play which prioritizes public interest obligations of advertising. This logic shapes how advertising is produced and consumed. My last example showed that the public interest rhetoric in relation to advertising is not simply a matter of particular advertising, of particular advertising aesthetics. It's also making advertising a matter of public scrutiny and enables Koreans to make demands on advertising, which might be unthinkable in many other places where advertising is essentially given up upon as naturally prioritizing interests of advertisers. The United States, I think, are the case in point in that. So a very broad observation with which I'd like to finish my talk is that advertising might be a global industry, but how advertising fits into social reality is neither natural, nor obvious, nor universal. It is ongoing local struggles that define what advertising says, who gets to control it, and where their control begins and ends. Advertising connections to larger structures are not automatic, but need to be renewed. In that sense, South Korea is a fascinating example how advertising is not foreclosed as a purely commercial domain guided by private interests and largely inaccessible to public claims, but is treated as a site and a means towards achieving a better society, however utopian the ideas that motivate this project might be. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Federenko. At this time, I'd like to open to questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Okay, don't say anything from here. Thank you for your talk. Um, you know, the humanist uh, public service announcement part of your talk, I wanted to respond to that and just to see if you could uh, differentiate Korean advertising um, in that category from American or European advertising. I mean, I just think of Coca-Cola saying you're part of this great inclusive world of happiness and uh, tolerance and um, uh, diversity, or uh, United Colors of Benetton, same message, or um, Subaru automobiles that you're going to have this incredibly warm and loving family experience as you see your children grow up and you keep your Subaru and they get to use it, or um, uh, the United States Army Reserves where instead of killing people, um, you're going to be you know, going out to um, hurricane-stricken areas and rescuing uh, cute little toddlers and bringing them back to their moms and dads and creating this sense of wonderful family uh, unity uh, 
rather than killing people. So, I mean, it, it seems at least in the United States that advertising is packed with humanist messages and propaganda like that, uh, dodging away from selling the reality of, of the product, which might have advantages. A Subaru car might get low mileage or something like that, but, you know, the feeling of those ads is that, you know, you're going to have this warm family experience. So my question to you, just to repeat it, is how is that humanist category that you were talking about uh, different than the way we do it here and obviously in Western Europe? Okay, that's actually a very helpful question. I don't want to say that humanist advertising is unique, special thing that exists only in Korea. And there are similar advertising with a sentimental aesthetic, which is to be found in many places. United States, I had some examples sent to me from Taiwanese advertising. So this is kind of an advertising genre that happens in many places. What is special in Korea, and that's kind of a blurry line, uh, for example, in the United States, when advertising is tells us sentimental, melodramatic story, and I'm thinking Coca-Cola ads, usually there is some kind of attempt to incorporate the product there and to make a case, okay, like you have this wonderful family, this beautiful images, and this is the advertiser, and they somehow part of it. So that connection is kind of more pronounced than in Korean advertising. And in Korean advertising, there is certain aesthetic when it's almost a matter of pride not to show the advertiser at all. Like for example, from that hero commercial I showed you, you'll have no way of guessing that it is telecommunications company. Like you have to know what SK is. So in a way, like those Korean advertisings, I would say they are go a little bit further away and shine away from the commercial me message. So they're not that fundamentally different, but I would say they're a little bit further on that continuum. So that's one thing. Second thing, what I find unusual in Korea is that it is those advertisements that everyone wants to talk about. Like in the US, my sense that the most loved ads would be humorous ads. Those ads are shared, those ads are discussed, and very few people would actually admit to their friends that they cried over an advertising. It's somehow not the proper way to respond to advertising if you're, you know, adult, critical thinker, all that. In Korea, that kind of reaction is welcome. It shows you that you're a sensitive human being. So I would say those advertisings are much more mainstream in Korea than they are here. Hi. Um. I have a question uh, pertaining to the, the guy you mentioned who started his own advertising agency to uh, make public service announcements. Since he's not really getting funding from any particular brands, where do people like that who support these PSAs kind of get the funding to put these commercials out onto air? So it's a very small agency he has, actually visited in summer 2013. Um, he gets a lot of orders for public service announcements from different non-government organizations. Recently, I saw his ads, which I think quite brilliant. So he's saying he makes advertising, which is relatively cheap to produce, but has a very powerful creative message, and he uses the media itself to convey the message. So among his clients would be newspapers, NGOs, and the recent ad I wanted to mention, he did a campaign for police department in Busan, in southern part of Korea. And the ad is a poster, has male and female version, so male officer and female officer, and they kind of stand in holding their hand like that. And on their arm, there is um, a chain which ends as a swing for children. So it's actual swing which people would, you know, use when they walk around Busan. So that's kind of advertising he makes. So. Such campaigns there would be relatively cheap because it's just setting up a poster. It's not big time advertising campaign. So he has like a niche for smaller, perhaps companies, most likely NGOs, government organizations, which want to improve their image. He has a website where he ex exhibits his advertising. It's actually all quite fascinating. When I went to his office, it was quite interesting because 
every aspiring advertising ad maker in Korea wants to make an internship at his agency. So he showed me like a pile of applications he's got and people tell like the stories that like I dreamt to become an ad man since I was, I don't know, three years old and this is what makes me suitable for this internship. So I don't know, I don't think he makes money of that, but it's definitely a certain buzz around his agency. It's about the issue of the advertising for conservatives, separate advertising. What kind of advertising? I don't understand that. I don't. Okay, so it's a bit of a complicated situation. So basically the issue was not advertising content. The content of advertising was not a part of that discussion at all. The question was how do companies spread their advertising budgets? where should a company place their advertisements? And the purpose of the campaign was to put pressure on companies to spend some of their advertising with a conservative camp where they're already spending it, but channel some of their advertising to the progressive camp. So the idea was if these companies want South Korea to be a democracy, they have this obligation to advertise equally to support democratic public sphere. So it was a project of democratizing advertising spending. And looking at it from North America, it might seem like a very strange undertaking because I think it's would occur to very few people to put such demands on advertisers because the idea is, well, you know, it's their advertising money, they spend it how they like it, yet in the eyes of that consumer organization, the way they saw it is advertising circulates publicly, therefore it has public obligations. People are consumers of those companies, they work for those companies, therefore they should have a say how they spend their advertising. So it's kind of a claim that, okay, advertising might be a private resource of advertisers, but because advertising has its public obligations, members of a public can demand that it's spent in a way that they see fit. Does it explain it? <laughs> I, just, I just don't understand how, how would the public benefit from getting advertisement, money, uh, money being put into uh, groups that wouldn't be interested perhaps in their product? I mean, why wouldn't they want to advertise to everyone? I, I, they, I imagine they were exclusive because they felt the conservative market would be interested in their product. So why would people who wouldn't be interested in their product want them to spend money on advertising to them? Okay, so I don't get the situation was, so it's about print advertising in Korea, conservative excuse me, progressive newspapers. And situation with print advertising in Korea is uh, somewhat complicated because the main three conservative newspapers are the biggest newspapers and they get the most advertising. And conservative camp would say that they get the most advertising because they have the widest readership, they represent most people, and basically they deserve it and it makes perfect commercial sense. Progressive camp and the organization I was talking about would be a part of that would say, well, it's not simply that, it's progressive newspapers, they are not getting sufficient advertising revenues, not because people are not interested, but because they're not powerful politically. So the idea is if someone advertises only in progressive newspapers, they would be criticized by conservative newspapers. So decision about where to place advertising, it's not simply a marketing decision which consumers you wanna to talk to, but rather a political decision. So they were trying to deal with a very political issue, yet the language they were using is that of consumer citizenship and advertising was there point of pressure which they thought they could inter intervene. So it was using consumer issue to intervene in a highly sensitive political issue in Korea. Thank you. That's always a complicated story to tell. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, you mentioned um, the soju ad and um, female sexuality um, a bit in that story. Um, and you have a great article on that, which I've read before. Um, and, you know, the image that's sort of prominent globally these days, right, is K-pop, right, of Korean women and um, highly sexualized images. And these images are used to sell products, right? Corporations have sort of bought into this and there's this deep intersection between pop music, sexualized bodies, and the selling of products. And so I was wondering if you could talk more about how all of that fits into the matrix that you describe how it fits into it. How K-pop and the intersection between popular music, sexualized bodies, and corp corporate interests mm -hmm. then sort of fits into what you describe here, or m maybe it doesn't at all, but the relationship. Okay, so the most typical mainstream Korean advertising would be advertising that uses celebrities, and there are no specific statistics. I saw different estimates that between like 65 to 75 percent of mainstream Korean advertising would have like some kind of celebrity feature there. So in a sense, humanist advertising, which I talked about, contrasts itself with celebrity advertising. And the logic of contrast that is celebrity advertising shows is glamorous people, it's probably Photoshop, that all this unrealistic standards and what, how does it make you feel? It makes you feel insecure, that you're not that skinny, you're not this and that. So basically the idea of celebrity advertising that it kind of promotes problematic things in Korean society, like obsessions with looks, plastic surgery perhaps, all that stuff. Humanist advertising, on the other hand, is usually praised that it portrays everyday life as it is. It shows regular people. And in fact, one of the common praises for humanist advertising is that it shows, and in English it kind of sounds gross, human smelling every day, saram nem and kind of that. And the idea is it's, like, it's so realistic, it's like visceral. Again, the idea is it's the opposite of that glamorous world of celebrities, but rather it is like you and me, people like us, having everyday life. And that hero ad, again, the idea was everyone is a hero, you don't need to be a celebrity. So there is this certain tension and humanist advertising kind of differentiates itself from regular celebrity advertising. Um, was that ad I briefly mentioned about soju commercial. It did use a celebrity and sometimes celebrity advertising is used to promote different social causes, but generally that's very rare. The purpose of using a celebrity is the idea that, well, if you have a celebrity, people will pay attention. And if they pay attention, in a way your job is done, you just have to name the product and tell the brand, so you don't really need a story to keep people paying attention. So in that regard, that ad was more of an exception than a rule. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Fedorenko. Thank you. Thank you.